Among vertebrates, the bird's lung stands out as a markedly different design from the alveolar lung of mammals. The bird's lung is smaller, stiffer, and it's connected to a series of air-filled spaces within the body. And it's appropriate to describe this kind of lung as a pneumatic lung. Let's refresh our memory of the basic lay of the land. Here's a silhouette of a bird, and the lung is contained about mid-body. The bird's lung is permeated by a closely packed set of parallel airways known as the parabronchi. The lung is also surrounded by a system of air sacs. For our purposes, we can lump the air sacs of the bird into two major categories, the anterior air sacs, or AAS, and the posterior air sacs, or PAS. The air sacs, lungs, and trachea are connected together in a complex series of airways. The posterior air sacs are fed by the trachea and bronchi, and the posterior air sacs in turn feed into a complicated array of airways known collectively as the dorsobronchus. The lung is also connected to the anterior air sacs by another large collection of airways known as the ventrobronchus. The ventrobronchus also feeds back into the trachea. The movement of air through the bird lung is radically different from how air moves through the alveolar lungs of mammals. An alveolar lung is ventilated tidally, that is, a parcel of fresh air is drawn in, exchanges gas with the blood at the alveoli, and then this spent air is forced out. The bird lung, in contrast, is a flow-through lung. That is, air flows in one direction through the lung and not back and forth. The bird's pattern of airflow is also a bit more complicated. In mammals, the respiratory cycle is tied one to one with the tidal movement of a single parcel of air. In the bird lung, two respiratory cycles of inhalation and exhalation are required to move a single parcel of air through the respiratory system. Let's now follow the movement of a single parcel of air from inspiration to exhalation. Keep in mind, of course, that other parcels of air are moving through the lungs and airways ahead of and behind the parcel we're going to follow. During the inhalation phase of the first respiratory cycle, air is drawn in through the nose and mouth, down to the trachea, and directly to the posterior air sacs, bypassing the lung. The expansion of the air sacs is brought about from the downward rotation of the sternum, which acts as a bellows. During the exhalation phase of the first respiratory cycle, air from the posterior air sacs is distributed through the dorsobronchus and down through the lung through the parabronchi. During this phase, oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged between the air and blood through a mechanism that we'll explore momentarily. The motive force here is the upward rotation of the sternum about the pectoral girdle, again a sort of bellows action. During the inhalation phase of the second respiratory cycle, air is drawn from the lungs into the ventrobronchi and then into the anterior air sacs. Finally, during the exhalation phase of the second respiratory cycle, air is moved from the anterior air sacs into the trachea and out through the mouth and nose. The parabronchi are where gas exchange actually takes place, so let's take a closer look at them. Each parabronchus is embedded in an array of other parabronchi. Air flows through them from the dorsobronchus on top down through to the ventrobronchus on the bottom. Radiating out from each parabronchial tube is an array of very fine blind-ended tubules known as the air capillaries. We'll get a better picture of how the bird lung works if we take a closer look at a single parabronchus and its air capillaries. Here, we see a close-up depiction of some air capillaries. Gas exchange between the blood and air actually takes place within the air capillaries. Air flows downward through the parabronchus, and deoxygenated blood percolates upward surrounding the air capillaries, becoming oxygenated as it goes. Let's take a closer look still at the fluxes of oxygen between the parabronchus, the air capillaries, and the blood. 
Here's a single air capillary extending to the right with a pair of bronchus on the left. Air flows downward through the pair of bronchus, and because this is freshly inhaled air, its partial pressure will be very close to the atmosphere's PO2 sub A. At the same time, blood is flowing past the capillary in a countercurrent direction to the airflow through the parabronchus. As blood flows past the air capillaries, there's a mass flux of oxygen into the blood, which oxygenates it. Because the oxygen partial pressure in the blood is everywhere lower than the oxygen partial pressure in the air capillary, mass flux of oxygen into the blood occurs along the air capillary's entire length. Let's take a closer look at these partial pressures. Along the length of the air capillary, partial pressure of oxygen will be bounded above by the atmospheric oxygen partial pressure, PO2 sub A, and bounded below by the oxygen partial pressure in the venous blood, PO2 sub V. Because oxygen leaves the airspace of the air capillary along the capillary's entire length, there's a systematic decline of partial pressure along the length of the air capillary. This means that there will be a diffusion flux of oxygen along the length of the air capillary driven by the gradient of oxygen partial pressure along the capillary's length. This means that bird lungs have an unusual relationship between ventilation and perfusion. As in the fish gill, another flow-through gas exchanger, there's a ventilation flux, in this case air flowing downward through the parabronchus, and a countercurrent perfusion flux carried along in the blood that percolates upward past the air capillaries. However, unlike in the fish gill, the diffusion flux in the air capillary is a significant limit on the capacity of the bird lung for gas exchange. This flux is at right angles to both the ventilation and perfusion fluxes. So, even though ventilation and perfusion are organized in the bird lung into countercurrent flows, these are less important than the limiting influence of diffusion flux at right angles to both. As a consequence, it's common to speak of bird lungs as being a cross-current gas exchanger. We now have at least three, possibly four, types of gas exchangers that we can now compare. These are the countercurrent gas exchanger of the fish gill, the sac-like tidal lungs of the lower vertebrates, the alveolar lungs of the mammals, and the cross-current gas exchangers of birds. We can now start to make some comparisons among them, and from this we may gain some insights into what has driven the evolution of the gas exchangers of vertebrates.